Good evening. Uh, my name is Bob Newton. I'm a special assistant to the president of Boston College, and I always ask people, do you know who the president of Boston College is? And uh, to my amazement, practically every undergraduate I know is able to name the president of Boston College, Father William Leahy. Anyway, I'm special assistant to the president of Father, uh, Boston College, Father Leahy, and I'm the interim director of the church in the 21st Century Center. And my uh, role is to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker. Uh, those of you who, who are unfamiliar with the church in the 21st Century Center, we started uh, about 12 years ago by Father Leahy in response to the clerical sexual abuse crisis in the Catholic Church. And it focuses on four uh, focal issues, uh, handing on the faith, the, the uh, sexuality in the Catholic tradition, the Catholic intellectual tradition, and handing on the faith. Uh, we uh, do a lot of different things. I hope you're familiar with them. The most recent has been Expresso, Your Faith. And if you haven't seen Shake It Off video, which was produced by two of our advisory committee, uh, which has now been seen by probably 100,000 people on the web, I advise you to take a look at it. Our, our speaker tonight, uh, when I read his resume, is uh, Boston College says it likes to graduate men and women for others. And uh, if you read what this man has done in his career, uh, I think you can, you can say he's a model of that uh, motto of uh, what a Jesuit education should mean. But let me go to my primary task, which is to introduce uh, the introducer, a uh, young man in the College of Arts and Sciences on the advisory committee of the church in the 21st century. Uh, Dom <laughs> Fazioli, right? <laughs> Good. It's good enough. <laughs> She's laughing at me over there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so we are honored to have with us this evening Jerry Straub, a documentary filmmaker, author, and producer. His work includes his critically acclaimed book, The Sun and Moon Over Assisi, which was named the best spirituality hardcover book of 2001 by the Catholic Press Association, among his other photos, essays, and reflections. Jerry has a distinguished career as a network television producer, which includes his role as a producer of the widely acclaimed series, General Hospital. His work as a secular Franciscan includes the founding of the San Damiano Foundation, which produces films in celebration of St. Francis in hope of the emulation of social justice, peace, and nonviolence. We would like to thank him for being here with us this evening. Before our talk, we would like to show some clips about Jerry's ministry. My name is Jerry Straub. I've made 18 documentary films on poverty around the world. I've filmed in some of the worst slums on earth, witnessing unimaginable misery and deprivation. The films don't shy away from confronting the injustice of global poverty, where more than 10,000 children a day die of starvation or diseases related to hunger. Produced by my new ministry, Pax Ed Bonum Communications, the films are a strong, consistent, and prophetic voice speaking out on behalf of the poor while encouraging people to enter more deeply into prayer and to be more compassionate to those in dire need. Besides fostering compassion for the homeless, hungry, and marginalized, the films hopefully inspire a genuine and respectful community among all people.
rooted in Franciscan spirituality, along with the mystical traditions of all faiths, Pax et Bonum Communications champions the importance of contemplation and action. We believe the best way to love God is through acts of love, mercy, compassion, and kindness, especially for those living in acute poverty. We believe that care for the chronically poor is an essential component of the spiritual life, especially for the followers of the nonviolent Christ. Our films stress the necessity of prayer, peace, harmony, humility, and social justice. In the ecumenical spirit of St. Francis of Assisi, we hope to show the connectedness of all of creation, which will promote a deeper understanding and appreciation of the common good and our essential need to become nurturers, healers, and consolers. May God give you peace. I begin all my talks with that phrase because that's the way St. Francis of Assisi always greeted people. My encounter with St. Francis uh, dramatically changed my life. I once was a network television producer, but beyond that, I was also a committed atheist. But as you'll hear a little later, St. Francis, by God's grace, changed all that. Uh, last summer, I was in Lima, Peru, and what I saw and felt still weighs heavily on my heart. Uh, I first went to Peru in 2005 to do a little film about a doctor, an American doctor named Dr. Tony Lazara. Uh, Dr. Tony was raised in a, a good uh, Catholic family. In fact, he even uh, went to a Jesuit high school. But somewhere along the line in medical school, he began to take a long, slow slide into atheism. Uh, but Dr. Tony wasn't just an ordinary doctor. He was actually the head of a neonatal care unit of a teaching hospital. So he was a very sophisticated, high-end doctor. Uh, and then once he went to India to attend a medical conference, and there he encountered poverty so severe it shook him to the core of his being and caused him to have a period of deep introspection about his life, about uh, the faith that he abandoned. And during the course of a year, this introspection, he was gently pulled back to his, to his Catholic faith. And one day, while attending Mass, uh, it was a, a missionary, a Franciscan missionary priest visiting. And the priest spoke about the need for medical missionaries. And Dr. Tony felt like God was speaking uh, just to him. And uh, he was single, and he wasn't crazy. Uh, so it <laughs> took him about a year to discern this, this call. And then he literally gave everything away, walked away from everything, and moved to Lima, Peru where he worked at a, a clinic run by the Franciscan Friars. But his heart and passion was for the kids. And so he uh, opened a, f a clinic, a free clinic. But what he discovered was the kids were so sick and so poor, and they came from such long distances that uh, they needed uh, time uh, to be healed. And so uh, on average, for the last 25 years, he's had anywhere from 50 to 60 kids living in his house for extended periods of time until they could be healed and returned to his family. And while they're there, he pays for all their medical treatment, surgeries, uh, uh, food, uh, medication. Uh, he brings in teachers, some of the kids that can actually go out to school. Uh, and the film was called The Patience of a Saint. And uh, for many years, when I started talking at high schools, the first thing I did was show the kids a clip about a a little boy named uh, Henry that Dr. Tony couldn't, couldn't uh, help, and, and he died. Uh, and so uh, when I went back to Lima, Peru last summer, mostly just to spend some time with Dr. Tony, I really wasn't intending to make a film. Uh, but I saw many of the kids who I saw in 2005 were still there, especially one young boy named Victor, who had no arms and one leg. Uh, so I'm going to begin by just showing you a kind of an updated version of this scene uh, called The Dying uh, Teenage Boy. 
and it begins uh, with my trying to retrace my steps and find my way back. When I first went, I was with a, a volunteer from Switzerland, Dr. Tony Survives by uh, Young Volunteers. Um, many college students go and spend uh, summers with him. So we'll just watch this clip. One day I learned that the social worker at the OGA was going to YCON, and I asked if I could tag along. YCON is a place that vividly reminds me that not every kid that stays at the OGA is going to be healed, no matter how hard Dr. Tony tries. For the last eight years, I've shown one very poignant scene from The Patience of a Saint at virtually every presentation I've given at schools and churches across the country. The scene is titled, A Dying Teenage Boy, which was set in Wicon. Wicon is located on the side of a mountain. Midway up the mountain is a busy section where the markets and shops are located. I wanted to seize the opportunity to return to Wicon. It took two buses and a motorcycle taxi to reach the impoverished area. The ride opened a floodgate of memories as I made the exact same trip in 2005 with a volunteer from Switzerland. The further up the mountain you go, the poorer the people are. Most people live in shacks and lack running water. It's a dusty, dry place with virtually no vegetation. People walk for miles up and down the mountain just to get basic supplies. Wicon is typical of the kinds of poor places where the kids Dr. Tony treats come from. I walked up the mountainside for a few hours just to get a better look at the conditions. All right, so this is the bathroom. Okay. Uh -huh. Ay. <laughs> Ay, bye. Bye. <laughs> I had hoped I could find the shack where I filmed the boy who died, but I could not. Here is that scene.
Days later, I was again moved to tears by what I was filming. This severely emaciated teenage boy is on the verge of dying from cancer. His name is Henry. Dr. Tony did all he could for him. Henry wanted to go home to die. Wanted to die, surrounded by his family. I filmed him in the shack of a home in Wycon, a shantytown slum clinging to the side of a hill about two miles from Dr. Tony's home. It grieved me to see this boy clinging to life in such deplorable conditions. A porous roof, straw and cardboard walls, dirt, flies, insects, old garbage, flea-infested animals, no running water, uncomfortably hot. The family had so little and were about to lose so much. When I first saw him, he was looking bad, but now he's so much worse. And I mean, here the animals are all around. It's just dirt and, I mean, look at his sisters. And for somebody to die in such a place, it's, it's a bit rough, no? The younger kids were filled with life, but probably had no idea how dismal their future was. Even the cat was sad and malnourished. Yet Henry wanted to be here, to feel the tender embrace of his family's love. Two weeks after I filmed him, Henry died. He was a good boy, Dr. Tony said, very polite and courteous. He never gave anyone any trouble. It's hard to look at Henry and this little screaming baby being bathed at the Ogar. But we must look at them. The real sin hidden within the plague of global poverty, where millions upon millions are suffering from hunger and curable disease, is our inexplicable indifference, our complicity and complacency. The gospel tells us we must not look away from the suffering, must not ignore the poor. The gospel tells us to embrace the suffering and the weak, to be God's healing hands. Christ wants us to visit people like Henry, to comfort them and sit with them. Christ wants us to be his arms and to embrace the poor. Christ wants us to be his hands extended to help the poor. Being with Henry <clears throat> was, uh, was hard, uh, but sadly, his situation is, uh, is all too common in the places where I've been. When I was working in network television, places like Wycon were far beyond the scope of my awareness or interest. Uh, back then, I didn't look at things uh, through the eyes of faith. And probably enough, uh, my renewed faith is why I'm standing before you tonight. I was raised a Catholic, was, a, was an altar boy, uh, went to Catholic grammar school and high school. I even attended a minor seminary, a Vincentian minor seminary, with uh, dreams of becoming a, a missionary priest and taking the gospel to China. But as an older teenager, I really saw no evidence of, of God in people's lives. I would go to church on Sunday and hear all about God's love. And I would leave the church and hear lots of hate-filled words as my neighborhood in <clears throat> New York City was slowly becoming racially integrated. Uh, during the 20s, I, I just slowly lost my, my faith and uh, quietly slipped into a very unsettled atheism. Looking closely at the world uh, drove me to believe that a benevolent, merciful, and loving God could not and did not exist. I mean, pick up a newspaper any day, and it's filled with unbridled violence crime, terrorism, bigotry, greed, lying, cheating, a plague of inhumanity. Yet 90% of the people around the world believe in God. And at the core of all religions is mercy, kindness, and love. But where do we see traces of those beautiful virtues? The economic downturn of the past few years was the result of widespread greed 
and a total disregard for the common good. It's really, really wonderful to hear Pope Francis talking about the common good now. Uh, our streets are littered with, with homeless people begging for spare change. Our hospital emergency rooms are packed with hardworking people who can't afford basic health care. And around the world, more than a billion people lack safe drinking water. And more than 10,000 children every day are going to die from hunger or diseases related to malnutrition. Can you even begin to wrap your mind around that staggering figure? I mean, whatever you did today as you go about your life, that so many kids are going to die for a lack of food in, in a world of such overwhelming abundance. Half of humanity survives on the equivalent of less than $2 a day. Where is, where is God in this tsunami of suffering that washes over humanity every day? Why don't we hear the anguished cries of the poor? Why do we put prophets ahead of people? Why do we prefer retaliation instead of reconciliation? These are the kinds of questions that, that troubled me deeply. Uh, for most of my adult life, I was in a, in a very dark, self-absorbed place, spiritually bankrupt. Uh, but by God's unmerited grace, I encountered the life of a medieval saint whose deep faith changed his world. And that saint, of course, was Francis of Assisi. And that encounter took me from the glitter of Hollywood to the most horrific slums on earth. Uh, for many years, I produced soap operas at all three networks. Uh, I gave Alec Baldwin his first acting job and Demi Moore, just to name a couple of people. Uh, by the time I was 35, I had produced the most popular show on the air, General Hospital. I like to tell people now I'm atoning for my sins. Uh, <laughs> I was the executive producer of an uh, NBC soap opera taped at Rockefeller Center in New York City. And that did actually star a very young Alec Baldwin. Uh, I was a big success. I had a glamorous job and I made tons of money. Uh, you know, more money than I could really spend. Uh, but something was missing. I had this, this deep emptiness inside of me. And I tried to fill it with all kinds of things, uh, mostly bad things. And so did many of my friends, especially in Hollywood, had that same, you know, same wealth, the same fame, the same power, and yet this profound emptiness. Uh, and they tried to fill it with all, all sorts of things, you know, mostly bad things. I mean, it was, uh, you know, drugs and alcohol and, you know, sex without commitment, but the emptiness never really went away because the emptiness really could only be filled by God. Of course, uh, I didn't know that then, and God was what was really missing in my life. Modern culture teaches us to be strong and independent, that we can make it on our own, that we really don't need God or each other. That's just simply not true. We're all weak and wounded in some way. We all need each other. And all of life is interconnected. That's one of the things of St. Francis, one of the great lessons of his life was the interconnectedness of all of life. And I vividly recall sitting in my office in Rockefeller Center and watching an episode of my soap opera and thinking, I'm not in the church, so I can say what I'm thinking. Uh, I, I, I thought, you know, who would watch this crap? And, and I knew, I knew in that moment that I was done. But to be honest, I could have never <clears throat> mustered the courage to walk away from what I was doing. But mercifully, the show I was producing was canceled, and I was offered another show back in Hollywood. But I, I declined to take it because I saw my, my chance to explore what happened to that little boy who wanted to be a missionary priest and ended up uh, uh, an atheist in the wacky world of showbiz? And I set out on a, on a journey to discover if there was a deeper meaning to life. And I retreated to a small village in upstate New York where I did little else but relentlessly read and ponder books on philosophy and theology. And I began to write. And I, I, I spent about three years writing a very dark, depressing novel about a man driven to suicide over his failure to find God. And the book was really uh, nothing more than an angry scream at the church uh, and also a commercial failure. Uh, the critics called it a philosophical novel. You know what that means? It means no one bought it. <laughs> you give them Luke and Laura on the run and you'll get you know, millions of viewers, but like a serious like, look into what is the meaning of life. It's, 
It sold about 300 copies, and I probably bought 50 of them. Uh, I then began a new novel that explored the connection between creativity and spirituality. It was titled The Canvas of the Soul, and the novel's pr protagonist was an unpublished uh, writer obsessed with the lives of Vincent van Gogh and St. Francis of Assisi. I was far, far more interested in Vincent than Francis because no artist had so thoroughly documented the creative process as Vincent did in these uh, amazing series of letters that he wrote his brother Theo, who supported him. Francis, on the other hand, was just a pious fairy tale from the Middle Ages who had really nothing to say to my very modern, skeptical, and secular life. After nearly two years of working on this book, it was hopelessly stuck, and I, I reached the point where I, I knew I had to abandon this, this literary dream, this, this search for some deeper meaning, and just return to the Hollywood Dream Factory and crank out more mindless soap operas that truly pandered to the most uh, sordid of, of, of human desires. But before throwing in the literary towel, I decided to take one more stab at trying to finish the canvas of the soul. And I thought that if I visited Arles in the south of France, and, and Assisi in Italy, uh, you know, places where Vincent and, Fran and Francis had walked that uh, I, I might be inspired to finish the book. And during my long absence from the Catholic Church and from God, uh, I remained friends with a Franciscan friar, an older man, uh, who always accepted my unbelief, always made time to talk with me. In fact, I used to have lunch with him at least once a year in a Jewish deli in Manhattan. And uh, I asked him if he knew a place where I could stay in Rome and Assisi. And <clears throat> really, all I was looking for was a, a free room. And he called uh, the guardian, the friar in charge of a friary in, uh, a friend, and, and uh, Collegio San Isidoro in Rome. Uh, that's, Collegio San Isidoro was a 400-year-old seminary uh, operated by the uh, friars from Ireland. And I was, really, I was given this rare privilege to stay there for a week. And I arrived at the friary, at the gate of the friary, one morning in March of 1995. And a woman working in, in the office escorted me to my tiny Spartan room. Uh, and she said that all the friars were out. I could join them for dinner. But the, the day was mine to wander the streets of Rome. So I headed out. Uh, after I unpacked, I, I headed out to see the, you know, the, this ancient city that I was really excited to visit. And as I walked through this cloistered area, there was a door to the church, which was open. The church itself was closed to the public. And as I walked past this door, a beautiful statue caught my eye. And I entered the church, not to pray. I simply wanted to look around before hitting uh, the streets of Rome. And I decided to sit in this uh, quiet place and just, it was nice and cool, and just, just rest for a moment. And an empty church and an empty man became a meeting place of grace. And as I rested in the silence, something happened, something highly unexpected. Uh, God broke through the silence, and everything changed. And in the womb of this dark church, I picked up a copy of the Liturgy of the Hours, and I opened it randomly to Psalm 63. And in bold face above the psalm, it said, a soul thirsting for God. And as I read the words of the psalm, my soul just, just leapt with joy. And I really wasn't used to reading the psalms or didn't even care about them, but it said, God, you are my God, I am seeking you. My soul is thirsting for you. My flesh is longing for you. A land parched, weary, and waterless. I long to gaze on, on you in the sanctuary and to see your power and glory. And without warning, I felt this this overwhelming presence of God. I didn't see any images or hear any words. What I felt was really far beyond images and far beyond words. As best I can say, I just felt immersed in this sea of, in, of love. And I knew, not intellectually as I was searching, but experientially that God was real, that God loved me, and that this hunger and thirst I had felt for so long could only be satisfied by God. So in this moment of revelation, I went from you know, being in, I was transformed from being an atheist into a, a pilgrim. I went from denying God to wanting to experience more of God. <clears throat> a few days later, I, I went to confession and uh, unburdened myself with many years of stuff. And uh, next morning, I went to the 
received the Eucharist and so in a span of just a few days in a place far from home, the whole direction of my life changed. And uh, over the years, the hillside town of Assisi uh, uh, became my spiritual home and opened the, the mystical windows of my soul. One of the friars stayed at, staying at San Isidoro was studying at a, I never tell this story, but I'm at a Jesuit school, so I have to, uh, was studying at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, a little school founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, the alumni include more than 20 canonized saints. And the friar convinced the Jesuit priest who headed the communications department, uh, told him about this Hollywood producer that was staying at the friary and, you know, maybe we could have an evening where the students got to ask questions as if, you know, as if being a Hollywood television producer qualified you to answer much of anything. Um, but uh, the priest said yes, and I, I went to this, this evening at the Greg, and uh, this led to my being invited to return to the school in the fall to teach a two-week course on creative writing for film and television. Uh, I graduated in high school when I was 17 in 1964, and I landed a summer job on The Ed Sullivan Show. There's a few gray hairs here that know what that is. It was a primetime show on Sunday nights, and in 1964, a little group from England made its American television debut. You know who that would be? Beatles. You got it. And I, I, I mean, I saw them. I was backstage, and, and, and it, was like, it was like absolutely incredible. And, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a long story, but I was invited to uh, uh, get a full-time job as a very lowly clerk, and much to my parents' horror, I accepted this instead of going to college. But back then, television was in its infancy. There were no courses in that kind of communication. So uh, I showed up in September at the Greg, and I, I wrote my nephew, uh, uh, Brian, who has two doctorate degrees, I said, dear Brian, my first day at college and I'm the professor. <laughs> so, when I returned to the Greg in, 19, in September of 1990, uh, 1995, uh, the priest uh, asked me asked to see my syllabus. And I gave him a blank stare. Uh, and he asked me again, and there was more silence. And I could see it dawning on his face that I had absolutely no idea what a syllabus was. And he asked again, this time more agitated, he said, where's your syllabus, you know? Uh, what are you going to do, your course outline? This is, you know, 40 hours. What, what, are you, what are you going to do each hour? And I simply shrugged and I said, I don't have a syllabus. And this real look of horror crosses his face and he said, well, what are you going to do every day? And I said very plain, plainly and very truthfully, I'm just going to make it up as I go. And he looked at me and he said, he looked at me like I had two heads, and he said, I'm sorry, that's a little too Franciscan for us. <laughs> and he found a young Jesuit seminarian to help me write a course outline, which was really very important because the first day I had 13 Roman collars sitting in front of me taking this class. Uh, and I overcame that rather shaky beginning and was invited back four more times in the cross course grew to 80 hours and crammed into four weeks, and uh, the syllabus grew into a, a little booklet on creating art. But at uh, any rate, while I was teaching at the Greg, I met this wonderful Jesuit priest who was a very renowned literary figure, and I told him about my novel, The Campus of the Soul, and he agreed to read it and offer me some feedback. Uh, I, I, I mailed him the heavy manuscript, and in December of 1995, I received a 10-page letter from him in which he cut the novel to pieces uh, as, as only a Jesuit could, bluntly telling me in relentless detail of how bad the novel was and how it didn't work on any level whatsoever. <laughs> and then on the bottom of the ninth page, it says, however, and I turned the page, it was typed on an old typewriter, it says, uh, uh, however, the writing on St. Francis is the best I've ever read. Throw this out and write a book on St. Francis. And uh, I, it took me a little while to, to, to hear what he was really saying, and I did. And I spent five years writing a book on St. Francis. And as I was writing The Sun and Moon over Assisi, and this is where we're, this is all going, the hardest thing for me to understand was the saint's love, not just for the poor, but for poverty itself. Uh, it really made no sense to me. I mean, I had lived 
such a pampered life. I didn't even know any poor people. St. Francis, if you read about it, chased after Lady Poverty. He wanted Lady Poverty to be his bride. Well, I spent my life chasing after Brother BMW. I mean, who wants to be poor? For St. Francis, voluntary poverty was a way for him to always be dependent upon God for everything. I can understand this on a, on a theoretical level, but on a practical level, it's very difficult to grasp, especially in our culture, which uh, promotes personal strength and independence. And in order to better understand, I lived for a month with San Franciscan friars serving at the St. Francis Inn, a soup kitchen in Philadelphia. And it was another transformational experience. Every concept I had about the, the homeless and the addicted turned out to be a misconception. I met real people, people just like me in so many ways. And I saw how easy it was to label a homeless person as lazy or an alcoholic as weak. The labels removed my obligation to do anything about it. It's their fault they're homeless. It's their fault they're addicted. Uh, but then I met a woman in her mid-20s, but she looked twice, as a, twice that age, and the friars told me a story, that when she was a baby, her parents, who were alcoholics, put alcohol in her baby bottle to keep her from crying. By the time she was five years old, she was an alcoholic. By the time she was a teenager, she was selling herself under the Kensington Avenue L to get money. And what was the money for? The money was to buy drugs. And the drugs were simply to deaden the pain of her life. And I began to see how people, some people are just going to be born in situations and circumstances where it's really impossible to just lift yourself up out of it. And I'm digging more now into the gospel and trying to really, really live this, this faith that I uh, just had, you know, re-embraced. And I realized that Christ didn't label people or judge people, that he reached out to them and he excluded no one. And I was so moved by the stories of the, of the homeless and so inspired uh, by the, the, the priests, the nuns, and the, and the lay people who lived at the St. Francis Inn uh, that I decided to make a little film. And so with the help of some of my network friends, none of us got paid. Uh, we made this little film. And amazingly, uh, it was broadcast by about 70% of the PBS stations. And over the years, the Friars received more than a quarter of a million dollars in donations from people who saw the film, people of all faiths, people of no faith. And, and they were able to build the largest soup kitchen to better serve their guests. And they added a second floor containing a chapel. And every day, to this day, about 60 people uh, and recovering addicts attend the Eucharist at the St. Francis Inn. And the film revealed uh, a new, deeper meaning for my life. And I knew what I had to do, to put the power of film at the service of the poor. And while making more than 20 films in, uh, oh, since then, I've lived with the poor in India, Kenya, Uganda, Brazil, Peru, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, the Philippines, Jamaica, and Haiti. And the horror of those sprawling slums in such faraway places often brought me to tears. Entire families squeezed into one room without electricity or a toilet. Naked kids being bathed in streets without, uh, with, uh, with water laced with bacteria. Women defecating in public. The stench of open sewers was nauseating. I was haunted by the massive garbage dumps in the Philippines where people live like, like, like vultures scavenging through the rotting waste of, of others. I was shocked by the sight of hundreds of people with leprosy in a leper column in the Amazon region of Brazil, people with mutilated faces whose arms and legs had been eaten away by a vile disease I had assumed had been eradicated long ago. Filming in the dreadful refugee camps in, in Kenya and Uganda. Uh, in Kenya, I was with a Jesuit refugee service. Really pushed me to the brink of hopelessness and left me with a, a really bad case of post-traumatic stress disorder. And tonight, I'm going to show you a few scenes from Kenya and Uganda. Uh, but I didn't really have to leave America to feel the pain of crippling poverty. In this country, 700,000 people or without shelter every night. The Boston Globe had a cover story today about the homeless here in Boston. 2000 and, in 2003, I, I filmed for six months in Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles, where 11,000 homeless people 
uh, struggle for survival in the shadow of astounding affluence. Every day I witness this endless parade of misery, pain, rejection, loneliness, people sleeping in uh, cardboard boxes under tops and in tents. Uh, uh, this is a 50 block area in, in downtown LA. Uh, every night more than in Skid Row, more than 700 kids are without shelter and they're forced to share space with uh, the mentally ill and drug addicts in overcrowded missions. Uh, in December of 2006, I went back to the St. Francis Inn to make another film and I spent part of a night in an abandoned building with a homeless man. The temperature was 10 degrees and the wind howled through the uh, uh, broken windows and, and, and the, the rooms were empty and strewn with all kinds of litter and broken glass. It was snowing through the porous roof. And the man told me that he was afraid to fall asleep because he feared a rat would go in his mouth seeking warmth. And I, I really couldn't believe it. I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, it's cold out. They get cold too. And inside you, it's, it's warmth. It was like he was putting himself in the mind of the rat, understanding the rat's need for, for warmth. Uh, but by far, the worst poverty I, and misery I ever encountered was in Haiti. Uh, I was in Haiti right before the earthquake, and I returned a couple of days later with a team of doctors uh, to document the unimaginable devastation and loss of life. And the sheer volume of injured overwhelmed everyone. Uh, there were amputations were being performed without anesthesia. Uh, the doctors that I were with performed 25 amputations themselves in the first uh, 24 hours we were there. Uh, it was cries all through the night, all day long. Uh, the roadway circling the hospital was just littered with bodies and surgical procedures were being performed outside, and I filmed it all. And in seven subsequent uh, trips to Haiti, I actually uh, lived in a massive slum. I had no running water, no electricity. I lived with, uh, with, rice and, uh, with rats and mice. Uh, and many of the people were so hungry, they ate cakes made from mud and contaminated water. I'm going to stop now. The rest of the night, there's going to be no real talking. I'm going to show clips and just make a few little comments in between. But that's just to set the stage how this all, all happened, OK? Uh, so this first clip we're going to show you is the, actually the first uh, 10 or 12 minutes of uh, the film in Haiti. In December of 2009, I began work on a film in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. As I filmed, I had no idea that within a few weeks, many of the buildings I filmed would be destroyed. And many of the people I filmed would be killed. On January 12, 2010, a 
powerful earthquake devastated most of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, killing more than 300,000 people and leveling most of the capital city. Life in Port-au-Prince before the earthquake was dreadfully hard. After the earthquake, it became a living hell. Many people tried to flee Port-au-Prince on the few dilapidated buses still operating, but most had nowhere to go. A year after the earthquake, a million people were still living in tents. Still living in overcrowded slums. A year later, most of the rubble had not been removed. And the spreading cholera epidemic caused by contaminated water had claimed more than 3,000 lives. The earthquake dramatically illustrated the importance of the common good and the absolute necessity of compassion. Filtered through the cruel reality of the intense, widespread, dire poverty of Haiti, this film was about the true beauty and transformative power of compassion. Humanity's survival hinges on that one word, compassion is our sole hope. Compassion is the heart of all religious and spiritual traditions. Compassion was the core of the message of Jesus. Yet, compassion seems far removed from modern life. This film has as much to do with suffering as it does with Haiti. Suffering is synonymous with Haiti. Suffering is the one thing that all humans have in common. We have no control over suffering. In one form or another, it visits all of us. And suffering changes us and makes us look at life differently. Suffering is a great teacher. It wakes us up to reality. Haiti and her suffering people have taught me much in the 18 months it took to make this film. Haiti taught me how to live, how to love, how to be whole. Haiti taught me about faith, hope, and patience. 
Edie taught me about death and resurrection. Welcome to Haiti, a school of life. My name is Jerry Straub. I've been making documentary films on poverty around the world for more than 10 years. I've been to the worst slums on earth. When I look into the sad face of a starving child living on the margins of a horrific slum, I find myself looking into the very mystery of life. Chronic poverty with its desperate and endless struggle for survival fills me with grief. Yet, these dreadful and hopeless slums can be sacraments of transcendence that can unlock our unconsciousness and lead us to a place of authentic solidarity with the poor. The mystery of poverty and pain, the very mystery of life and death, is too deep, too sensitive, too fragile to be truly understood, let alone solved. But in these dreadful places of extreme desperation, I often catch glimpses of hope and the quivering feeling that life is truly magnificent and precious. The cross is clearly visible in these nightmarish slums, but so too is the joy of the resurrection. After nine trips to Haiti during the country's most tumultuous year in its long, tortured history, I was left with countless images that are forever seared into my mind the endless, mutilated crush victims, the horrendous living conditions, the sick, dying, and dead. Yet for me, all that I witness can be best encapsulated in two simple and common objects, a mud pie and a kite, that speak plainly and clearly to the despair and the hope I found in Haiti. On my desk in my library, I have a mud pie I brought home from Haiti. I could never imagine being so hungry and so broke that I had to resort to eating something made from mud and contaminated water, something so vile it could make me very sick or even kill me. A mud pie symbolizes, for me, the extreme poverty of so many Haitians. Mud pies are baked in ovens of anguish and hopelessness. I'll never forget my first visit in December of 2009 to City Soleil, the worst slum in Haiti. The widespread devastation, the tin shacks, the rotting trash, the spewing sewage, a little girl urinating in the garbage, a woman defecating in the open, Naked kids with bloated bellies running barefoot through pig-infested mud. It was all too much to take in. And then there was the fetid and nauseating stench from rotting garbage that was intensified by the blistering heat. The place literally assaulted my senses, left me feeling helpless and emotionally wrought. And then... All of a sudden, and totally unexpectedly, something fun and joyful caught my eye and filled me with hope. It was a makeshift kite fashioned out of a plastic garbage bag. It seemed to laugh and dance in the Caribbean breeze that momentarily kept it awkwardly aloft. Other kites were made of soiled paper plates. In a place that made no sense, a kite was something I could understand. The kids and the kites lifted my spirits. It showed me how imagination could lift the human spirit out of the muck of sadness and hopelessness. The endurance and innocence of the children countered the madness and injustice of the adults. And so, for me, Mud pies and kites came to symbolize the death and resurrection that is a daily event in Haiti.
Uh, the brokenness of the people I've filmed around, around the world the last dozen years really helped me to see how we are all wounded in some way and that we are all in need of boundless mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness of God. Uh, my encounter with extreme poverty really helped shatter my false ideas, values, and illusions and revealed my own clinging selfishness and my complete dependency upon God. In these slums, I really discovered the radical nature of Christianity. The incarnation teaches us that God is humble, that the richness of God is revealed in the poverty of Christ, and that God lives in our poverty and weakness. Jesus embraced and loved the poor and rejected, and Jesus denounced power that leads to injustice and poverty. If the gospel is not about love, and justice, it's been reduced to mere sentimentality. And the struggle against injustice is intertwined with our own struggle to enter into a true and full relationship with God. We really do need each other, and we need God. And true faith is really, I think, not possible without compassion. And I think St. Francis knew that every act of mercy and kindness brought him closer to the reality of God. The saint understood that followers of Christ must be in communion with the poor and must be willing to, uh, to love our enemies. This is really our faith. Uh, in 2005, I was invited by a priest from the University of Notre Dame to do a film on undocumented migrants. I had just finished spending six months on Skid Row in, in LA. I, I really didn't know about undocumented migrants, and I actually didn't even want to know. I was tired, and, and he had saw a presentation I gave at Notre Dame, and he kind of pleaded with me to just take a little trip to Mexico with him. And well, one thing led to another, and we did this film called Endless Exodus. And, and I realized that this issue was, was a really hot-button political issue. Uh, and we didn't, want to, we didn't want to get involved in that. The whole idea was how do we see the face of Christ in the face of the undocumented migrant? And uh, so we went and we traveled deeply through Mexico and El Salvador uh, to see uh, the conditions that people live in, why they migrate, uh, to follow their trail uh, up through the desert. Uh, at one time, we actually were, we were not given permission to uh, ride along with the border patrol. Uh, uh, until they found out that I had been the producer of General Hospital, and the guy in charge of the Border Patrol w w watched General Hospital every day in college, and the next thing you know, we're in a big SUV in a high-speed chase across the desert, and I didn't know whether to hope that the guy, the, the migrants escaped or were caught, you know, because that would be more dramatic to film. But at any rate, uh, we made this film, and along the way, I spent a little time in El Salvador with a Dominican nun, and one day she took me to visit. She, we were riding on an old bus, and she said, oh, we got to get off here, and we go down this embankment. We have no idea where she's going. She actually had a habit on, and, and she said, well, we're visiting Moses, and I envisioned uh, an old man. Moses was not an old man. This is Moses. Moses has an incurable blistering disease. He lives in El Salvador. I never get immune to the pain I film, but seeing little Moses truly upset me. The memory of him haunts me. I've seen some terrible things in my visits to developing nations, witnessing firsthand a lot of extreme suffering. Yet all the suffering in the world for me, was embodied in this one small, fragile boy. Moses is, without a doubt, the saddest person I've ever seen 
including the many lepers I encountered in Manaus, Brazil. Moses is nine years old, but his body size is that of a four-year-old. Except for his sweet, round face, his body is covered with ghastly sores. He has no hair. His scalp is covered with blisters. This rare, loathsome disease has gnawed away his fingers and toes. I don't know his life expectancy, but the disease will eventually kill him. His mind is sharp, and he is very aware of all that is going on around him. His big eyes are pools of suffering and serenity. He has a frightening stillness about him. He is wise far beyond his age. He lives with his mother and brother in a poorly constructed hut located down a steep hill off the main highway. Life speeds by little Moses as he sits in a hidden ravine with barely enough food to survive. With families like this, they must choose between hunger at home and finding food in a foreign land. Extreme poverty pushes people to migrate. I was profoundly moved by Moses' mother. Her entire life, already unspeakably hard, is dedicated to caring for her dying son. This humble mother's love reminded me of Mary's unselfish, self-emptying love for Jesus. Uh, making Endless Exodus nearly destroyed uh, my ministry. I was always able, no matter how hot it was, to raise funds to do films on global poverty, but to do something on undocumented migrants. Uh, the, the money really wasn't there. I even had someone once say, who knew me, and who was in ministry himself, he said, why is Jerry doing a film on undocumented migrants? They're just breaking into our country and stealing from us. So I knew how deeply ingrained these, these negative attitudes were. Uh, while I was editing the, uh, the, sh the film, uh, a PBS show called Religion and Ethics News Weekly uh, did a story on me, and a reporter came and interviewed me in the editing room, and all this uh, footage was on the monitors and stuff, and we gave them some footage from, uh, from the film. And I never saw the piece when it aired, but apparently as the reporter was asking me questions and I was answering, they had random shots and included, and it was maybe five to 10 seconds of Moses, little Moses without any context whatsoever. Uh, but yet, just seeing that, not even knowing the story, so touched one viewer that he contacted PBS, uh, wanting to know how to get in touch with me because he wanted to pay to have Moses brought to the United States for treatment. I put him in touch with this Dominican sister. But sadly, Moses' condition was, uh, was really terminal, and there was nothing that could be done with them. Uh, my ministry was able to give uh, the mother a little money so that she could stay in that, that little hut that she had, that she could care for him in some, some uh, peaceful manner as best she could. Uh, but what the sister discovered was there was a little girl in the village that had the exact same condition as Moses, but in the very uh, early stages of this disease. And so she was actually transported by the man who saw it on Religion and Ethics News Weekly. I think it was to Green Bay, Wisconsin. So uh, what happened, to show you the power of film to touch emotionally, uh, just a few seconds of Moses without really any, any story uh, motivated this guy and some other little girl, well, it wasn't able to help Moses, little Moses, uh, some other girl in the, <clears throat> in the village was spared the same uh, faith that Moses uh, had. Uh, two weeks ago, I gave a, a retreat uh, in a, for a, the staff of the, in, the, in the diocese in Texas and uh, had a couple of hundred people and I had uh, the full day to, to fill up. And because I had so much extra time, I played a scene I, I rarely play, one which I personally had not seen in six or seven years. And I was really totally surprised uh, by the uh, viewer's reaction to it. And so I'm going to just uh, uh, squeeze this in tonight. It features uh, uh, the, second, uh, the second film I did at the St. Francis Inn. Uh, features a Franciscan priest named Father Mike Duffy. 
And the scene begins with a flashback to the very first film of the St. Francis Inn, where Father Michael is delivering food to a, to a family. And it's a very tough, tough scene. And then as soon as that's over, it, it cuts to you know, five or six years later, and he's still delivering food to, to another, another family. So uh, just watch this, because it it's really is domestic poverty and the kind of stuff you probably don't really see. It's not homeless. It's kind of the hidden homeless, people who are living in homes but really don't have the resources to, to survive. Oh, there she goes. Hi, Nita. Hi, Michael. Oh, look who's here. I haven't seen you for a long time. One of the most distressing and most unforgettable scenes in We Have a Table for Four Ready featured Father Michael delivering food to a family who lived in extremely deplorable conditions. Grab this. <laughs> Look out, look out. They gotta get this in, this is heavy. Well, let him come on, y'all come in, come on. Come on, y'all. Uh, this is a heating, kitchen gets heated by this. You can see that, that's the heating. This sink, uh, if you took this and go down like that, was here yesterday, went down there, on the, all through the pipes on the floor, the cell is full of water. Yeah, take them in the basement. They, they have two toilets in the house, and uh, both toilets are plugged up. How many days now, Nita? Almost a month. Look at the floor. Almost a month. Right here. Let me show you there that. are all sorts Come of on, uh, the door. kids here that you know they have to go to the bathroom, and it's, it's just in the toilet, just sitting in the toilet. Now, Nita, come here. You want to tell them uh, uh, how much a month you pay for this? I pay one fifty-one a month. You pay one fifty-one a month, right? And uh, how many children do you have to support? I got six kids. Five and five grandkids. And how much do you get uh, a month to spend? Five, five, eleven, forty. So you have between three fifty and four hundred dollars to raise, and that means medical. And you take medication. Yes. Uh, she's sick herself, so she she needs a lot of medication when the kids get sick and there's a newborn baby in the house. And school supplies. You're always coming to me. You say, yes. Kids need Christmas, school. holidays. Yeah. And and they don't get from the school. They don't give them any supplies no. like. By paper and pencils, pencils and stuff. Yeah. yeah, every September, Nita comes to me. She needs the whole kit and the caboodle, right? <laughs> <laughs> I tell, I call people. I say she's my wife, right? That's my husband. Every time she gets in trouble, she comes to me, and I'm not even married to her, right? But you're happy sometimes, right? Now y'all want to see the toilet? Yo, oh, I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait for the toilet. As bad as that house seemed to be, there's even a lot more to the story. For instance, her oldest son is about 16 years old, and just he, yesterday he had a seizure. He has a, he's afflicted with seizures, and he had one that was so bad that he, today he's in intensive care at Newman Medical Center. That's one of the reasons why she is extra depressed today. She just, when we left the house just now, when she called me over to whisper to me, 
she asked me if I could give her a few dollars. And the reason she wants the few dollars is she needs to buy garbage bags to go into the two toilets and put all that is stuffed in those toilets, that's about three or four weeks worth of human waste, into garbage bags and take them out of the house before her friend comes and tries to fix the plumbing. So she's not having a good day today in any way, shape, manner, or form. Eight years later, Father Michael is still delivering food to families forced to live in dreadful conditions. Hi, girls. My Hi, Mike. Oh, Lord, look who's here with the dog. Yeah, yeah. How you doing? Uh, in between. Being in this home was tough for me. The living conditions were brutal. We don't get to see families like this very often. They are not homeless. Their poverty is hidden. Sadly, these harsh conditions are all too common for the poor. For these five women, life is a continual struggle for food and heat, the basics that most of us take for granted. But you could see their spirits being lifted simply by the fact that Father Michael remembered them, cares about them, and brought them food. Just being with them goes a long way toward lightening their burden. Is that how you heat this house with that? Yep, kerosene heater. Kerosene heater? Yep. Because you can get sick with that. When we ask you for help, <laughs> it's for kerosene. That's what we mean by yeah. that. Yeah. We, get, we add kerosene. You have no kerosene, so you're heating the house with the element in the oven. Yep. And all the four burners on top yep. are heating the whole house, first and yep. second floor. This is really hot, but to do a whole house, that's another thing. Another basic human need, besides food and shelter, course is to have the shelter heated. It doesn't do too much good to have a home if it's not heated and so that's a and especially this winter huge problem for lots and lots of people and this is an example of one. We Don't are. fall against the stove. I hate to see you fried. <laughs> <laughs> they always pick on me. All right well I have to okay, take honey. up. All right uh, it was you. nice seeing you. you. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right, God bless. I'll, I'll see you before Christmas. All right. They say, oh, there's heating assistance. If you don't have heat, just go to the government. You can apply for it. She did, and she applied, did everything, and they gave her $162 for the entire season to heat the house. That's why they have the electric stove on. And even those kerosene heaters, even though that's the cheapest form of heat, the problem is it gives off fumes that are not healthy at all. And everyone says they're not supposed to be used in a house, but it, you're faced with either you using an unhealthy heating system or freezing to death. So they do that. Most people really have, just have no idea even what the poverty is like in, in, in our country. And I, so specialized more in, 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 in foreign countries and situations, but this is, uh, uh, I, I hadn't really seen that for many, many years before I showed it in Texas, and, and I think that, that clip upset people more than anything. Uh, there's only three scenes left, and the whole evening is building towards the last two, so I hope you can bear with me. I, I, I would like to squeeze in one little extra scene, uh, 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 Two years ago, I made a film uh, for Jesuit uh, Refugee Service in Kenya. In fact, uh, the priest that uh, uh, let me give a course at the Greg for those uh, four years is now in his mid-80s, and he lives in, in uh, Nairobi, and he teaches at a, at a college there, and he's an amazing guy. Uh, picked me up at the airport, drove me all over the place, 83. Uh, and he, he, he arranged for me to, uh, to, to film with JRS. Normally they don't allow cameras and stuff like that, but I uh, actually uh, spent part of the time uh, in Nairobi uh, filming the work that they do with urban refugees. Many people don't want to go into these big refugee camps because there's really like no way out. And so they kind of live in the shadows of big urban centers. So we focused a lot on that. And then we flew up into the desert and, and uh, a good deal of the film is set in a, in a huge refugee, refugee camp, which was uh, quite a thing to experience. But I'm only going to show you one little very short scene uh, 
that uh, features the, uh, the main garbage dump in Nairobi. Kenya, impoverished refugees are living amongst impoverished Kenyans. To see the poorest of the poor, one morning I drove to Nairobi's main garbage dump, where hundreds upon hundreds of people sifted through the rotting, stinking, smoldering waste for scraps of food to eat and bits of metal and plastic to sell. Competing with the people for scraps to eat were very large birds that were so big they were taller than most people's waistline. The sight of so many women and children spending their days this way is truly upsetting. You really get up close in a garbage dump like this and actually walk into it. You begin to see that these figures that you could see from a distance, many of them are actually young kids. It's mind-boggling to think that a kid has to spend his days in a garbage dump searching for anything, anything that he can use for survival. I mean, it's terrible for adults, but kids, that this is their childhood in a garbage dump. I spoke with and filmed one small boy named Morris, who said he was 15, but he appeared much younger. He's here in the garbage dump, rummaging the stuff to survive. This little boy, this, this shouldn't be his life. There's, there's no, no excuse for this. Three men, all garbage scavengers, escorted us through the massive garbage dump. Their presence smoothed the way for me to film the extremely poor as they desperately picked through the putrid waste. The noxious odor was making me nauseous. As we walked out of the dump, the three men begged us for some money, plaintively saying how hungry they were. I had a little less than 100 bucks with me, and not much more than that back in my room at Mill Hill. I had already realized that morning that I had not taken enough cash with me to cover my modest daily expenses. I gave each man 100 Kenyan shillings, the equivalent of less than $1. They were grateful, but noticeably less than pleased with that meager amount. Of course, I could justify not being more generous. In practical terms, giving more money than I had in my pocket would have required my fishing out and opening my concealed wallet something I was afraid to do for fear that they would grab it and run away. But in all honesty, I'm ashamed to admit I was more worried about my own modest needs and the needs of the film than with their extreme physical needs. As we drove back to JRS headquarters, my driver and I stopped for a bottle of cold water and a snack. After the choking stench of the dump and walking around under the blazing African sun, the water tasted very delicious. Later that day, when I got back to Mill Hill, I took a nice, long, hot shower, washing off the dust of the dump. I then went to the dining room and took a cold beer from the fridge and drank it in the beautiful garden as the sun slowly set. Adding to the pleasantness of the moment, a brother bought me a bowl of chips to munch on. And later, I had a very nice meal with the brothers and other guests. The food was good, and I could have used another portion of macaroni, I was very hungry because we never stopped for lunch. I was, in hindsight, less than pleased with the abundance of hospitality I had been given. It's stunning to realize how often enough is not enough. The three men from the dump were slowly slipping from my consciousness and memory, their hunger unabated. I began the day by receiving sacred bread during the Eucharistic celebration. But during the day, I failed to give physical food to the hungry, thereby making a mockery of my morning devotion. The Old Testament had a term for the poorest of the poor, anawim. The anawim were people completely overwhelmed by want. They had no voice or rights in their surrounding community. 
Scripture makes it abundantly clear that to forget the Anuam is to forget God. Jesus made care for the Anuam a litmus test for our love of God. The people in this garbage dump live off salvage scraps of discarded waste. God wants us to salvage the discarded scraps of their lives. We live in a world of cruel poverty, terrible injustice, iniquitous inequality. We need to face this reality, analyze its causes, and demand structural changes to eradicate these evils. We must give hope to the suffering. We cannot worship God and be indifferent to the poor. Worship without justice and charity is blasphemous. The essence of Christ's message is, make every stranger, no matter how poor or dirty, no matter how weak or unlovable, your neighbor. The people in this garbage dump are your neighbors. St. Gregory the Great said, when we attend to the needs of those in want, we give them what is theirs, not ours. More than performing works of mercy, we are paying a debt of justice. Okay, these last two clips from, come from Uganda, and they are the, the whole evening has kind of driving to these two, two clips. Uh, uh, this film was made, as I said, in, in Uganda. It was called The Fragrant Spirit of Life, and it featured uh, one Jesuit priest, uh, two other uh, diocesan priests who did things, but the main bulk of the film featured a, a, a woman, a Baptist woman. Her husband was a Baptist minister from Vermont, and they had a very unique way of dealing with orphans, and, and uh, their organization was called Village the Village, a little village in Vermont helping a little village in northern Uganda. And uh, at the time, it was just coming to the end of this uh, uh, long civil war that was going on in Uganda, uh, instigated by a madman named Joseph Kony, who had something called the Lord's Resistance Army. I'm sure you've heard about it, they were the ones that began uh, kidnapping children. And, and, and making young boys become soldiers. It was kill or be killed, uh, kidnapping uh, girls, literally going into villages and, and taking these kids. And the girls would become sex slaves for their generals and commanders. And uh, there have been a couple of films about just the, 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 the aspect of the kids, what they live through. Uh, really uh, horrendous. And we visited uh, many survivors from this. People had arms and things, um, different body parts just cut off by the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, they at one night kid, uh, kidnapped a whole a bunch of seminarians and uh, one, one seminarian survived and was returned and, and it was like struggling with, you know, that he had committed so many murders while he was in captivity and does he still become a, a priest? I mean, just horrific issues. Uh, I, I was really blessed by an opportunity to have the cardinal from uh, Uganda uh, talk, take me through the IDP camps, internally displaced persons camps, because these were people from Uganda being interned in Uganda for their own safety. And at the height of the war, there were a million and a half people spread out over 60-something camps. And the bishop, uh, the cardinal actually, uh, had a hut in one of the camps. This impressed me greatly. And he spent two, two days uh, a week living in the camp to be with the people. And I thought, wow, <laughs> imagine. Uh, and he was, he was absolutely wonderful in his uh, uh, just openness and generosity to me and explaining things. Uh, so this, uh, last, this next to last scene uh, doesn't really need any explanation. You'll see Lori. We had been driving around. We were in the main town of Sarodi. And uh, we had it at the band, band service and took an opportunity to, to visit a hospital. On our last day in the area, we returned to Soroti early in order for James to get the van serviced. With a free afternoon at our disposal, we decided to visit an internet cafe to check our email. Afterward, as we took a long walk back to the hotel, we passed the Soroti hospital. Lori told us about the dreadful conditions we decided to peek in and see for ourselves. We're here at Soroti Hospital, which is where we bring patients when they can't be handled in the village. In Soroti District, there is one doctor for every 22,500 patients, one midwife for every 8,000 women in labor. Children are born and die in the same day because of lack of medical care, lack of professionals, because a lot of them go to the West. 
So we're here where the serious problems in this district are, care are taken care of, and yet they're really often not taken care of. You don't associate the word hospital with chaos and neglect. The place took us by surprise, did not feel like a place of healing. It felt like a place without hope. Most Americans have seen starving kids in dreadful poverty before, even if only on TV. We know, at least on some level, what that looks like. But we rarely get to look inside a hospital in such a poor area. And what we saw was shocking and upsetting. The smell was nauseating, made me want to gag. I doubt I will ever forget it. This little boy right here we saw inside, and he's sitting in the dirt. He just urinated right where he's sitting. And, uh, the conditions here are just so deplorable, it's uh, beyond imagination. You know, we just came from a rather joyous celebration of Village to Village, and so many kids filled with hope for a new and better life. And while it's wonderful for those 50 kids, we just drive 27 kilometers to Soroti, we're in a children's ward, and we see this kind of severe malnutrition and malaria and other diseases. Uh, what's their future? I mean, the contrast between, you know, those happy kids in, in Village to Village and these kids here is uh, it's just a very difficult transition to make. A patient at this hospital is literally on their own. For instance, the hospital does not provide food, so the grounds of the hospital are littered with families and friends cooking for the patients. If you have no one cooking for you, you don't eat. Moreover, a patient's family and friends must also procure the medicines they need, including IV fluid. I was filming this boy, and the father said he had a liver problem. And I asked him if they'd uh, purchased the medicine yet, and they said no. And the medicine's between 15 and 20,000 shillings, which is around 8 to 12 dollars. And they would have to go back to their village, sell something, and come back and try to buy the medicine. So they, they, they hadn't purchased the medicine yet. So. Um, we got together enough to, to get him his medicine, and hopefully that'll uh, begin the process of his healing. It's just unbelievable that tiny amount of money they don't have and they really can't get. And this hospital, you have to provide everything yourself. Nothing is given to you. You can see his belly is completely uh, distended from the infection. Okay. This child also has a severe liver disease. He is in great pain, and the discomfort from his extremely distended belly prevents him from laying down. So he gets no sleep and is forced to sit up all day long. This little boy is three years old, and he weighs about 13 pounds. And, uh, also is suffering from a liver problem and severe malnutrition. At night, the family members, all these family members you see, put mats down and sleep under the beds. And uh, there's a lot of moaning, there's a lot of pain, because there's not enough staff to keep up with the pain medication. And the, these people are in tremendous amount of pain. I'm sorry. The little boy's name is Emmanuel. He's all alone over there because he has TB. So he says his chest hurts, but he's getting treatment. Last summer, when we brought Adike Betty here to try to get treatment for her HIV AIDS, 
We had such difficulty. We were trying to get the government doctor to come see her. We took her to one clinic. We took her to another. That's why we now use a private clinic. But we took her to one government cl clinic after another, and they didn't care. They didn't come. And we visited her every day and watched her decline. We brought her IV fluid. We brought her food. We brought her bed sheets. And yet, the medical care was what she was here for. We couldn't bring her that, and she died. She died. That night after dinner, we returned to the hospital to better document the nightmare. We're back in the Sorosi Hospital here at night, and it, it sounds terrible to say it, but it literally smells like a hamster cage. Um, it's just this, the smell of urine and sort of, um, and just, I guess, bodily odor sort of fermented over time. Um, and it's just insanity. There, all the families that were outside are sleeping in the hallways, under the beds, beside the beds, and uh, there's just people crammed in everywhere. And there are mostly no mosquito nets, and there are mosquitoes flying around. And you think that all these illnesses are sort of being mixed, and if, if a parent has an illness and their kid is here, but they're sleeping among all the other people and kids, this could be a, a hotbed for the spread of more sicknesses. The sight of so many seriously ill and virtually neglected people sleeping on the floor and under beds made us sick. The sounds of moaning intensified the horror. Amazingly, as we walked through the various wards, no one asked us what we were doing. No one asked us why we were filming. There really was no one in charge, no one to question or stop us. The sick, too, were virtually ignored. I prayed I did not get sick, would not end up in what was little more than a warehouse for the sick and dying. film, I, I, I said I prayed that I didn't get sick. Well, in fact, I did get sick. I was in, in Gulu in the north, uh, which there was still some sporadic, you know, violence and gunfire and kidnappings going on. It wasn't exactly a safe place. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate to be staying with Camboni Missionary Sisters. There's an Italian order of nuns. Uh, and they had been in, in Africa for 50 years, and many of the sisters were in their, in their 80s and, and amazing ladies. Uh, and I had the great blessing of having a little cinder block room that had the added blessing of having a toilet. And I got very, very, very sick. I had a fever of over 103. I was uh, freezing and sweating at the same time. Uh, vomiting, diarrhea, you name it. I, just, I was just like totally falling apart. And the sister, one of the older sisters came into the room and said that she was pretty sure I had malaria and I had to go, they had to take me to the hospital. Well, I had filmed at the hospital just a few days earlier. And as sick as I was, I had a little bit of humor left inside of me and I was able to say to the sister, uh, is, there, is there any chance we could go to Lourdes? <laughs> <laughs> and she, she got the gist of what I was saying, that I didn't really want to go to a hospital. And she assured me that they were going to take me to a Western hospital that was the, for uh, relief workers, for Western relief workers, a smaller but high-end clinic. And they took me in. Uh, my time there, the bill came to like 25 bucks. And I got some super uh, injection, and it knocked the malaria out. And the lesson I learned from that was that, really, for me, uh, Malaria was an inconvenience uh, for the people I was filming. Uh, malaria was a death sentence. 
They didn't have $25. Moreover, if they were in the camps, uh, they, were, they would have to walk 10 or 15 miles to the nearest medical facility of any kind, uh, which probably wouldn't be able to do anything for them anyway. All right, the, this whole night's coming down to this last scene, and it's really hard. It's going to be hard to watch, but as you look at it, uh, don't uh, enter into any darkness about it, uh, because it really, uh, this, this story has a very beautiful ending that shows the transformative power of love. So the kids you're going to see are, are all okay, I'll tell you that up front. And uh, uh, I don't really think it needs anything else. What just happened here? We're, we can't go any farther than this. We have to start walking. After our visit with the blind man and his mother, we drove to an even more remote cluster of huts located far into the bush. People living in the bush truly live a hidden life. Few people see the pain of their isolation and need. Lori finds these hidden hamlets. We literally made our own road through the bush to get there. And when we got there, we came across the site, which pained us deeply. This is Esther. And this is her older brother, Sam. Their behinds were shriveled and laced with deep lines left by their shrinking body mass. Their legs were tiny bones covered in dried out skin. It was clear to me that starvation had pushed these helpless kids to the verge of death. This little boy is seven years old. Look at the size. Look at my camera. Seven. Seven years old. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> Severe malnutrition leads to death. It stunts growth and forces the body to turn on itself for food. Sam is under three feet tall and weighs under 20 pounds. Both Sam and Esther were also afflicted with polio. Neither of them could walk. We could not imagine why they were abandoned, left starving, lying hopelessly in the dirt. As we tried to absorb the nightmare before us and figure out what we should do, a little girl emerged from the bush. This little girl is a sister, and she was actually cooking for them at one point. Uh, can you imagine? It was Sam and Esther's older sister, Jane, a very small eight-year-old. She had walked miles to fetch the water in order to bathe her brother and sister. We and our cameras attracted the crowd. The sight of the kids paralyzed the crowd. They could only stand in horror and watch. We watched in utter fascination as this little determined girl bathed her siblings. While most eight-year-olds are busy playing, Jane faced a life-and-death situation alone. She could not feed her hungry brother and sister, but she could see how dirty they were, and it was within her power to take a long walk for some water, lug it back, and bathe the kids. Little Jane, a hungry child herself, assumed the awesome duties of a parent. <coughs> to look into the face of a suffering child is to see the depth of humanity and the heart of God. And we are able to drop all vestiges of our selfishness and desire nothing more than to see another experience relief and joy. Most organized religions, sadly, devote much of their time and energy to defending dogma or destroying dissidents. When kneeling before a fragile little boy like Sam, those kind of petty and immature religious practices dissolve 
into a sea of insignificance. Love is all that matters. And love compels us to reach out to Sam and Esther. size, age, all by herself to walk, God knows how far, to get this water, to go out and bathe those kids is beyond anything I could ever imagine. She's, she's like a little, a little hero, a little heroine. Amazing fortitude and strength inside the people here, even at this young age, to know what to do and how to do it. Pretty astounding. After the little girl bathed the kids, Lori uh, handed her a number of little packages of peanut butter crackers. We had them with us just because we never know when we're going to eat again. And so what was amazing to me is the little girl opened the package, and you know she's hungry. But the first thing she did was gave it to the kids, and I was really actually quite surprised how they just devoured those cookies. I wasn't sure you know, what they could do or couldn't do. And then after she had given them each a cracker, she took one for herself. It's like the gospel right there, putting others first. Well, I think that this is the, this is the challenge, is instilling hope, and that some of the, these kids are dying for lack of hope because people have given up on them. And the more we can instill hope in these families, the more they will try because they know that it'll succeed. Even us, it can feel hopeless and endless because we see the need without having the resources to do what we need to do. And yet, you know, this is what it's about, is giving them hope. We've seen a lot of sad and tragic situations, but not like this. I think this is the thing, is that every child can be yours. These kids are beloved of God and they've been given up on. You will be able to forget this place and those kids. We won't forget them. We'll be seeing them. We won't leave them. I don't like leaving them just tonight. We've got to do something so that we can make lifelong change for these kids rather than one week's change or one day's change or one month's change. Come see. Oh, they can sit up now. After eating a few crackers, they were just starving. Just starving. Lori said she had to do something. This is what she did. The next morning, we went to the market, and James purchased about two weeks' worth of food. And this is going to us to feed the little kids we saw yesterday. It will take them some time feeding on this. So far, what you have bought, it's worth the American dollar. That will be like about 20 bucks. After picking up some clothing, we were eager to return to the hamlet. Lori also purchased two mattresses so Sam and Esther would not have to lie on the hard ground. But Sam and Esther needed more than cookies, food, mattresses, and clothing. They needed serious, long-term help that addressed the root causes of this family in severe need, a family living in virtual isolation, beyond the scope of any outside humanitarian help. 
After leaving Sam and Esther yesterday, Lori tried to learn the details of their lives from the village leaders. The mother had long ago abandoned the family for unclear reasons, but spousal abuse seems likely. Before running away, she tried to drown the children in a pit latrine, but the hole was too small. The father is a drunk who spends his days in the village. Sam and Esther contracted polio when he was just learning to walk and she was still an infant. Care for the three children had fallen on the shoulders of their grandmother, who provides care for eight children. They all slept in a tiny hut on a dirt floor with only a few blankets. Two days before we happened upon the scene, the grandmother left for a distant village in order to dig, that is, to cultivate root plants which form the basis of the diets of most of the poor in the region. The grandmother left because the kids were starving. She left the kids in the care of some neighboring adults, but clearly they had not fulfilled their obligation, most likely because they could not care for their own overwhelming needs. And so, little Jane was left in charge. James had purchased enough food to ensure the grandmother would not have to leave the kids for at least two weeks, enough time for Lori to figure out how to get Sam and Esther the medical attention they needed. In a country ravaged by civil war, with over a million people suffering in displacement camps, hundreds of thousands of AIDS orphans, a deadly scourge of malaria, cholera, and dysentery in the midst of deep-seated poverty. Two little kids in the bush outside a small remote village are easy to overlook, easy to ignore. But having seen them, we could not ignore them. We decided to give $300 of our direct aid money to Village to Village so Lori could arrange transportation to take Sam and Esther to a hospital about 35 miles away and cover their medical treatment, which would initially amount to nutritional rehabilitation. Lori Kroll has a mission, bringing hope to those trapped in hopeless situations, such as the one that imprisoned Jane, Sam, Esther, and their exhausted, heartbroken grandmother. And when I got home, I told the story of Sam and Esther. Uh, I wrote an email to all of my supporters and donors. And within, within a few hours, a man from Ohio called and said he would pay for their medical treatment for one year. And, uh, and he, uh, uh, the kids were taken to, to Kampala, which should be a two-hour drive, but the roads are so bad it took eight hours. And, and they were put in the hospital, and they were really responding and doing very well, uh, getting strong, especially Sam. Uh, little Esther had been deprived of food a little bit too long, so she uh, wasn't doing quite as well. Uh, but then, Uganda being Uganda, inexplicably, the hospital closed, and the kids were brought back to, to the little village of Sereri, returned to the care of the grandmother, and Village to village representatives began to see their situation deteriorate, so they developed a new plan. Lori has a, a, a program for high school for girls, and two girls who graduated uh, took the kids, went to Kampala, and lived in, a hotel, in, a, in an apartment, and she took them to out care treatment three days a week, and where they really thrived until after a year, they were able to come, come back to the village. Sam could actually walk with the aid of uh, uh, braces. Uh, I adopted or sponsored little Jane, and uh, some kid took, uh, took this thing, and I'll just show you the first two minutes just so you see some visuals of it. And uh, 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 Jane is, is going to school and, and learning, and she actually uh, somehow, I didn't even know what Skype was, but she figured it out. Uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, one day while I was, uh, this work is very hard, emotionally draining, spiritually draining, physically draining, and I was in a kind of a dark place when she called, and I wasn't in my office, and I came back, and there was a message, and it said, hello, Jerry, this is Jane, I am happy, thank you. And when I sit in front, stand in front of hundreds of kids like I did this morning at and I will again tomorrow morning at Catholic Memorial. Uh, I tell the kids that that phone call was worth all the big Hollywood paychecks ever were. And uh, 
another kid uh, put this thing on, on YouTube, something else I didn't know about five years ago, and over 400,000 people saw this clip of Sam and Esther and Jane, and people from all over the world have, have donated to, to Lori Kroll and Village to Village, uh, which was really barely hanging on when I went and did the film, and now it's really thriving. Being with, with children like Sam and Esther, uh, really forced me to face my own poverty and my own weakness and my own insecurity and my own brokenness. And I think during the last 14 years, I've, I've learned something very important. And it's, it's simply this, that Christ is not asking us to be successful or even to be productive. Christ is looking for us to be present, to be present first and foremost to God in prayer, and then to be present to each other present to each other in acts of love and mercy, and especially present to the poor and the suffering. But here's the deal, and I knew it as a teenager, and I tell these kids all the time around the country, we really don't take Jesus seriously. We don't love our enemies. We don't turn the other cheek. We don't forgive 70 times, seven times. We don't bless those who curse us. We don't share what we have with the poor. And I think really most importantly, we don't put all of our hope and trust in God. We don't go through every day thinking that every breath we take is literally a gift from God. We say, I'm not a saint. We say this gospel stuff really can't be meant for everyone, that the gospel is just an ideal. Uh, but the gospel isn't merely an ideal. The gospel is the way. And we need to take time to see how we've strayed from the way in ways large and small. We need to take a really good look at our lives and to turn away from all of our self-centeredness and to turn away from everything that blocks us from being more, more fully united with God. Now is really the perfect time to begin to emulate Christ's self-emptying love by performing meaningful acts of charity. Now is a really a perfect time to begin to take Jesus seriously. Thanks for listening. I know this wasn't easy to watch, but thank you. There's not many here, but if you have questions, I'm happy to. There's not usually very many questions immediately after this. All right. Did you want to mention that um, your books are on sale? Oh, yeah. I wrote a, a book on Sun and Moon over a sissy. Uh, is, is out of print. Uh, people are actually buying copies of it on, on the internet. This doesn't help me. But they're paying like $300 a copy, so another publisher uh, had me write a new book on St. Francis, taking just some of the elements of Sun and Moon over Assisi and then adding on to it all of my experiences since I wrote that book in the slums around the world. So it's still basically the story of St. Francis and how trying to uh, follow his life more closely and and where it's led me. So it's called The Loneliness and Longing of St. Francis, and it's only been out a couple of weeks. So.